Okay, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about marketing in general. So let's start with definitions. What is marketing? And by now we probably know a lot about marketing. At the end of the day, uh, you are a professional consumer, right? You've been a consumer for, uh, in the case of my students, let's say roughly about 20 years, right? So you really know and understand very well the marketplace. Uh, you've been making decisions as a consumer for many years. So what is marketing really? Some people, if you ask them, will tell you marketing is about advertising, right? And what I'm going to try to tell you today is that marketing is about more things than that, right? It's not only about advertising. It's not about selling products that people don't want, and that it's not marketing. Uh, that's other things, but not marketing, maybe. Uh, Slishy uh, sales tactics, right? And so marketing is essentially about creating value. The key aspect of marketing is this creation of something that the consumer actually really wants, right? This idea of value, right? And this is totally 100% determined by the customer. So what is valuable in the marketplace is determined by the customer and not you. And the reason why you create value is because you're trying to establish a relationship with the customer. You're trying to make sure that the customer keeps coming back. Right? This is what we mean by a relationship in marketing. We're not talking about a romantic relationship. We're talking about making sure that uh, the customer is satisfied and because of that, they are going to keep coming back. So this idea of selling to somebody something that they don't want, obviously it's not marketing because it doesn't really lead to a relationship when people realize that what you're selling them or what you're creating for them is actually not something that they are interested in. They are just going to stop coming, right? And the reason why we do this is because we are trying to share some of this value with the customers, right? So the idea is we create the value, the customer comes back, and hopefully because of this, we are going to be able to make money. And also the customer is going to be happy with the product or service that we are providing, right? So marketing is the whole process of creating this value and managing this relationship with the customers to make sure that they are satisfactory for both parties in the exchange, in this case, the firm and the company. Okay. Now, like I was mentioning before, uh, this idea of value creation, uh, it really stems from the fact that people, uh, all humans, have intrinsic needs, right? What is a need? A need is something that you're lacking at the time, right? It's a felt state of deprivation, right? It's when you just wake up in the morning and you realize that your stomach is making noises, right? You have this growling in your stomach or, I don't know, maybe you're walking by a store and you smell this amazing smell of pizza, right? And now suddenly you realize that you were a lot more hungry than you realized, right? So this idea of feeling hungry right? It's really not something created by a marketer, right? These intrinsic needs that we have have been there for at least millennia, probably a lot longer than that, right? So, and it's not only about physiological needs, right? As human beings, we need uh, other people. We are social animals. Uh, in fact, if you think about uh, what is the highest uh, punishment that we give hardened criminals in prison, at least in the United States, what we do is we keep them in solitary confinement. We basically put them away from the rest of the prison population, right? So we do have this intrinsic need for people. And there are other needs, right? We need to communicate, right? We have this need of self-worth. We need to make sure that we feel like we are something that... Um, it's it's important and it should be important for us and for others right and these needs have no change at all in thousands of years they are the same needs now what happens and the reason maybe why we get confused is because needs and wants are related but they are not the same thing so what is a want a want is essentially a need that is translated because of social and technological uh, interaction. So what do I mean by that? Let's talk about communication. Communication is an intrinsic need that we have had forever, but it has been translated into different ways of actually um, satisfying this, this need, right? 
So, for example, if you go really back in time, uh, the way people will communicate was mostly orally, right? Uh, after all communication, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, somebody uh, discovered that you can actually write, right? So writing enabled communication in other ways uh, through, you know, books or maybe early on uh, other materials that were used to write on, maybe a wall of a cave, right? Uh, pictorial maybe representations right? uh, and then over time that need has maintained but the form in which we communicate has changed right so we've come from that to maybe uh, using other ways of long distance communication for example smoke signals right and then after that you know we've moved into different technology and societal needs have adapted the need of the communication to other forms like for example the telegraph the telephone, right? And now, uh, what will we do without a cell phone, right? And, and text messaging and, and on and on, right? So all these are wants. They are basically expressions of the need for communication that take different forms because society has changed and technology has changed as well, okay? So that's basically the difference between a need and a want. A want is a need that is shaped by technology and culture, right? And then finally, we have demand. Now, demand is different. Demand is a want that is backed up by purchasing power. What do I mean by this? Well, in my case, I want a Ferrari. I love cars. I love sports cars. So I would love to own a Ferrari. But realistically, that is not going to happen, at least not in the next 10 years. That's for sure. So because of that, if I want a Ferrari, I probably will buy a little matchbox version of a little car, right? That looks like a Ferrari, but I really cannot afford a $300,000 car, right? Uh, on my budget, right? So because of that, that is not really demand, right? Even though I want a Ferrari, I cannot actually go and purchase it because I do not have the financial means. So because of that, it's not actually demand. So you need to realize the distinction between wants and demands. The only difference is buying power, right? Purchasing power. Can I actually afford it or not? Okay. And these three key uh, aspects are going to be very important. Realize that needs are not created by marketers. They are intrinsic to the person. Wants can actually be shaped by marketers because of culture and technology. So if you come up with a new technology uh, that enables you to do something that you couldn't do before, like for example, you can text over a network, right? then if people find that useful, they will actually want that product, in this case, a smartphone, right? And if the smartphone is inexpensive enough and people have a high enough income, then that want will translate into demand. And that's the way marketing essentially functions. So we don't create needs, we just shape wants and demand. Now, marketing as a term, uh, although it talks about value and, and exchange management, right? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it has changed over time. So originally marketing uh, was mostly about uh, being able to have a product or a service, but you know, in the beginning, uh, probably talking more about products uh, available in the marketplace. What do I mean by this? Well, if you go back a long time, let's just say to the Middle Ages, just to not go crazy, right? If you go back to the Middle Ages, uh, people almost had nothing, right? So people were living in less than a dollar a day of today's uh, living standards, so that we have an idea. Um, and what's interesting is if you have the money and you wanted to buy something, let's say you wanted to buy shoes. Shoes were not readily available in the marketplace, right? And most people have one pair of shoes, maybe with plenty of holes on them, and they will basically fix these products or make them themselves because you couldn't just go and buy shoes. And when I say shoes, this applies to pretty much every product and service, right? There were some markets, but it was uh, totally a crapshoot whether something was gonna be available or not in the market that was local to you. And obviously you have no access to anything except your local markets, right? So this idea that marketing was just mostly about production. If you could make it, you could sell it. And the reason why is because there was very little uh, supply in the marketplace. So initially marketing was mostly about production. 
and one of the big breakthroughs in production happened during the industrial revolution where uh, we put together uh, the power of uh, energy for example the steam engine right and uh, some of the concepts in engineering they talk about specialization so you have uh, people like Henry Ford uh, using production lines to really drive down the cost of uh, products and very importantly being able to manufacture sufficient quantities so at this stage it's mostly about producing things if you can make things you can actually sell them when supply of the products started to becoming more plentiful because people started uh, making products instead of you know in an artisan manual way when you move to a production system where there are factories that actually are able to produce you know uh, reasonable uh, large sizes of of output right so when you have enough um, product being sold in the marketplace what started happening is that you know there starts being more competition it, now it's not true anymore that if you can make it you can sell it and the reason why is because there is more options in the marketplace people are catching up they are producing enough of the products and services and uh, at least sufficient enough quantity that product uh, competition starts appearing in the marketplace and what this does is it drives companies to move from just making sufficient quantities to start improving the products so marketing move from the production concept to the product concept so this idea is that now you move from just if you can make it you can sell it to if you make a better mousetrap right then people will come right so this is the idea of the product concept can you improve the product quality sufficiently or performance sufficiently that people will be interested in your product right so this drove a lot of improvement and innovation around improving products and and services right but after product quality gets sufficiently high, what happens is um, it starts becoming less and less important. There is this idea of diminishing marginal returns to quality, which is that, you know, when you improve quality of the product, you know, a little bit, it goes a long way early on because, you know, the product wasn't that good to begin with. But as the product is sufficiently good, and you can see this, for example, in the computer uh, market. So if you're buying a laptop, most laptops in the marketplace, unless you have a very specialized need, like, for example, if you're going to do a lot of editing um, video, right? Uh, video editing is a very uh, resource uh, heavy task that you complete uh, in a laptop, right? So because of that, if you are doing a very specialized job like that, maybe you need special resources. But for the average buyer, uh, the quality of computation, let's say the uh, availab availability of computation capabilities within the existing laptops, it is very much uh, sufficient for pretty much everybody. So in that situation like that, improving the product is not going to get you a long way. And the reason why is because it's already sufficiently good enough, right? So you don't need to upgrade to the latest and greatest chip or memory or definition of the screen because it's already good enough. So in a situation like that, you move from, you know, making the product better to actually try to sell the product right so you need to put more emphasis in things like advertising right communicating to the customer what the benefits of your products are right so you move from the product concept to the selling concept so marketing now was more about communication of the benefits maybe you start coming up with uh, new ways of delivering values it's not about improving just the product but maybe about uh, lowering the value right sorry the value the price right so you come up with things like coupons uh, that will enable you to actually move the product because there is sufficient competition, the products are sufficiently good enough at this point. Yeah, you can improve quality, but there is a point where uh, there are diminishing marginal returns. So what do you do? You move into communication. And then after that, there is a big breakthrough. The big breakthrough happens right here. Okay. Until this point, the way companies have operated is essentially they think about what they can do like, you know, if I'm making computers, it's because, you know, maybe I'm a computer engineer and I know all about computers, right? So I'm not thinking about what's best necessarily for the customer. What I'm doing is I'm starting with what I know how to do and then I move into, you know, try to make something that the customer is going to want based on that. 
but the marketing concept changes that dramatically all right and now what we do is we put the customer first and this idea is that you start instead of by from where what are the things that you know how to do to asking the customer what are the issues that they are struggling with right what are the things that they will need some help with what are the products or services that they are unhappy with right what are the pain points and based on that, those pain points try to come up with new offerings meaning either products or services or combination of the two that will basically enable the customer to be satisfied right so the idea basically turns in at, on its head. It's not, I know how to make this, so I'm gonna make it and see if I can sell it. Now the idea is you talk to the customer, see what they want, and based on that, you decide what you're gonna make. And that's the marketing concept. This is where it really radically changes, right? And I think this is where we are for the most part for companies that are being successful right now. Now there is a different story here uh, that I, I don't think the book discusses, which is this idea of societal marketing, which is where some of the marketing folks think that the discipline is moving to. And this is the idea that you move from just trying to look at the customer and try to see what's best for them to start thinking about what's the best for society. Now, in my opinion, this is a tricky concept. And the reason why is because it's hard uh, for everybody to agree as to what is best for society. You can see this in politics every day. There is no agreement between large groups of people. So because of that societal concept, I think, honestly, it's a little bit more risky. But it's the idea of instead of trying to maximize the well-being of the customer, is to basically try to maximize the well-being for society at large. Okay? So as you can see, marketing has evolved over time in its concept from... Uh, this idea of, you know, if you can make it, you can sell it, to the idea of uh, you need to improve the product, to the idea of you need to communicate better with the customer, to the idea of, okay, you should start with the customer first and build from there what's valuable for them, to uh, maybe what we are heading today, we'll see, is this idea of trying to improve society overall. Now, uh, this slide, what it tries to do is tries to put into perspective the whole marketing system, okay? And so let me walk you through it. And the idea is we start with understanding what the environment is. What, what are the area, what, what, what is the issues that we're gonna be facing, right, in the marketplace? And, and hopefully with this information, we're gonna be able to make better decisions uh, better marketing decisions in this case uh, that are going to enable us to um, create that value for the customer. So where do you start from? You start from understanding uh, the different aspects in the marketplace. And I'm going to emphasize uh, a couple of aspects that are particularly important, especially customers, right? So what we're going to first do is we're going to come up with some sort of systematic way of understanding what's happening in the marketplace. I'm going to give you guys a framework. It's going to call the five C's framework, and you can see it. It's basically captured by this row uh, right here in this diagram that uh, essentially uh, tries to measure or tries to ascertain what's going on around the company. Okay, so we're going to go through the different buckets. I will walk you through those later. But what this is going to enable us to do is understand who our customers are, what are they interested in, uh, what are their pain points, if any, uh, who are our potential competitors, uh, whether now or in the future, or maybe if you're coming up with a radical new product, maybe you look at some product substitutes, other things that customers can use to um, fulfill a similar need or the same need. Um, also, we're going to try to see who we are right, as a company. Uh, what kind of capabilities do we have? Uh, maybe what kind of capabilities do we need to get that we don't have because of what we see in the rest of the marketplace? We're going to also talk about collaborators. We are not going to do this alone. right? So you're going to talk about, for example, your channels of distribution. right? So those are companies that help you take the product to the market. Like, for example, retailers. Like if you are a company... Uh, that makes, uh, for example, ice cream, right? You're not going to sell that ice cream directly to the customer, right? You're going to probably um, use other retailers like Walmart, Target, 
etc., to actually get that product to the market. And those are collaborators that you rely on to actually enable that value that you are creating for the customer. Okay. And then finally, there's a huge bucket here that I'm going to call context. And this is a whole host of factors like the economy, right? I mean, right now, there's a lot of discussion about what's going to happen with the economy because of the whole virus infection, right? So what happens to the company when the economy suddenly comes to a halt, like is unfortunately happening right now, right? So we need to understand what's happening, right? And all these buckets are important pieces of information that we need to be gathering pretty consistently so that we can actually make better decisions. Decisions about what? Remember, it's about creating value for the customer. So how are we going to create value? Well, we're going to look at all these aspects, right? And then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to try to come up with a marketing strategy. Strategy meaning, um, in our case, there are going to be two pieces to this strategy, right? I'm going to outline here with the two red arrows. The first part is what we call segmentation, targeting, and positioning, right? And the book talks mostly about segmentation and targeting. I'm going to outline for you also what positioning is because I think it's important. Okay. Um, but essentially the idea is once that you understand what the environment is, uh, then what you need to do is you need to basically uh, take those customers and put them into groups. Why are we going to put customers into groups? We're going to call that segmentation, by the way. The reason why we're going to do this is because ideally you will treat every customer uniquely, right? We all acknowledge that we are all different. We all want different things. And because of that, it would be ideal if we could actually, you know, treat every customer differently. But at the end of the day, that's probably not going to be economically feasible in every industry, right? And because it is expensive to custom create, for example, a car, right? So because of that, what we do is we just have you know, maybe a few options, right? And how do we come up with the options? How do the companies come up with the idea of an SUV versus a minivan versus a sedan, right? Well, it's this idea of segmentation, right? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to put people into groups that are maybe more likely to have similar needs, and we're going to call those segments. And we identify this by looking at all this information that we were talking about before, right? So this information is going to fit in here. Right. And by doing that segmentation, what we're going to do is we're going to identify groups that are different. Right. Maybe call it group one and group two. And we're going to try to treat those groups differently. So this is going to be kind of a, you know, in between between treating everybody the same. Right. Which will be captured by the idea of. What Henry Ford said when he was asked about the Model T for right. Uh, which was that you could have any color so long as it's black. So this idea that there's only one product or one service for everybody, right? And the other extreme, which is having unique products for everybody, which is customized uh, products for everybody, the idea in between is have segments and maybe a few options, right? So we're going to talk about segmentation. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do some targeting, which is essentially pick which one of those segments are going to be more interested in. And finally, we're going to do some positioning, which is the idea of how we want our products and brands to be perceived by the customer. Okay, It's all about perception, as we're going to see later, because this is the way we see the world as humans. Right? It's about perception. And how do we achieve this positioning? Well, the answer is going to be through our marketing mix, which you have in this row right here. Actually, let me use a different color, right? Uh, so that I hopefully don't confuse you too much. Uh, this box that I'm writing around, this is our marketing mix. So it's our product, our promotion, our price, and place, which is honestly, it's kind of a stretch. We call it place just to call everything starts with a P, right? So we call this the four P's of the marketing mix. But price, it really means distribution. Distribution is how you get the products or services to the final consumer, right? So from your factory, if you're making something, all the way to the final consumer, how does that product get there? And the answer is going to be distribution, or in this in this diagram, is going to be called place. You know what product is? We're going to talk more about each of these aspects in the following lecture. Promotion, so we're communicating to the customer. And price, well, what can I tell you? You know prices. And after you have this strategy, with these two aspects are part of our marketing strategy. 
what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to align all these um, elements in here to try to either acquire new customers, which means you sway somebody to buy your product because uh, the value that you're offering in the marketplace is superior in some way that it's important for them. Or you try to retain existing customers. So if you already have a customer, you try to make sure that they keep coming back. If you remember our marketing definition, it was about establishing relationships. So you either have new customers that you're acquiring or customers that you're retaining. And that's what's going to lead to your profitability. Right? Now, how are we going to achieve all this information that I was talking about in the first uh, row on that diagram? Well, we're going to have to do some research ourselves. We're going to call that marketing research. And it's basically a systematic collection of information that is relevant to marketing decision making. Okay, so you're going to need to collect information so that those decisions that you make are actually grounded in facts. Right? So it's something that you need to keep going. It's, it's an ongoing process. This doesn't stop, right? Because if you stop looking at the marketplace and see what's happening, uh, you're probably going to get uh, hammered, right? Things are going to change and you're going to be continuing to do the same things that you were doing before because they were successful. But as the situation changes, if you don't adapt, your strategies, uh, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna be in trouble, right? So we're gonna have to be doing this marketing research, which is essentially a collection of information. Right? Uh, how are we gonna collect information? There are different ways of doing this, but there are going to be essentially two different types of information that we're gonna collect. It's gonna be either primary data or secondary data. Let me start with secondary, and then we'll move to primary. So secondary data. It's when essentially you use some information that was collected already previously for some other purpose. This is the important aspect, right? So, for example, when you go to the Census Bureau, right, you can go online and you can uh, collect information about the demographic makeup of, let's say, of the Ashland area. Right? So if you want to know the number of people that live in Ashland, the average age and, and income, and you, you can get all sort of uh, demographic information from the Census Bureau. And you can actually assemble this data with other data to actually uh, make some decisions about, for example, uh, pricing. Right? So you could use this information, but this is secondary information. Why is it secondary? Because the reason why that information was collected was different than the one that you're going to be using it for now. It doesn't really matter who collects the information. Yes, it was the Census Bureau, right? But the important thing is, was that information collected explicitly for the purpose that you're trying to address right now? And if the answer is no, then it is secondary data, okay? You have all sort of secondary data uh, that is used all the time if you do any Google searches, to look for information about anything, for example, about your competitors, hey, that is secondary data, right? And this data was generated for other purpose and you're just repurposing it at this point. What else do you have that is secondary data? All your sales records within the firm, right? So there's a lot of information. Or for example, if you have a website, which, you know, who doesn't, but if you have a website for the company, obviously a lot of the information that you gather from that is secondary information, right? It can be used for other purposes, like for example, for segmentation, but that was not the original uh, reason why that data was collected, okay? And then you have primary data, okay? Primary data is different. This is data that is explicitly collected just for the reasons that you're trying to address at this point. So what defines primary data is the purpose of the data collection, not the data collection method, Right? You could use a survey, you could interview people, you can use mystery shoppers. A mystery shopper is somebody who comes to the store, a store for example, if you have a retail store, pretending that uh, they are a customer, but they are not. They're just trying to evaluate how, for example, our salespeople are uh, operating with customers or how the system is working or uh, how our return policy is functioning, right? So this, this will be Mr. Shopper. This is all different ways of data collection, but the important thing is the idea of why are we collecting this data? And if the answer is for this purpose that we are trying to address right now, then it's primary data. 
okay you can hire somebody else to collect this primary data for you you can hire a market research company that will help you collect the data so it's not whether you collect the data that determines whether it's primary or not okay i want to really emphasize that because people usually get confused with this um okay now let me walk you a little bit in more detail because you're going to need to use some of this in your project uh, let me walk you through this first line in that diagram that have this uh, five c's right and this five c's uh, framework is useful for collecting information about the situation of the firm this is basically an exhaustive or fairly exhaustive uh, framework that enables you to really make sure that you don't forget important aspects uh, of information that it's going to be useful for you to make decisions uh, in the marketplace right so what are the five c's the five c's are customers company competitors context and collaborators i've already shown you that in the diagram right so now what we're going to do is we're going to walk through each of these a little bit in more detail to see what kind of questions you should be asking in each of these different buckets of information that you're going to have to collect to make better marketing decisions so let's start with the customer arguably i will say this is the most important of all the different dimensions that you should be really paying attention in the marketplace uh, because at the end of the day the reason why the company exists is to provide the customer with a product or a service that will satisfy their needs and if you realize this then the customer should be centric to every decision you make so you really need to understand customers now understanding customers is actually a very difficult thing so let me just tell you it's the most important but it's not easy if it was easy everybody would do a good job and everybody would be making lots of money but it's not the way it works right so let's talk about what kind of um, questions you should be wondering uh, asking sorry not wondering uh, about customers so first uh, you need to try to understand how customers see the world right and for that you need to understand perception right perception is the process by which information about the world is captured by our senses and processed by our brain right so we use our senses to understand what's going on around us and as a consumer whatever you perceive is what reality is going to be for you so because of this one thing that you will hear in marketing a lot is that this concept of perception as reality because at the end of the day it doesn't matter what is objectively true what matters is what is perceived to be true by your customer and notice that as human beings we have all sort of limitations from a perceptual standpoint we perceive certain things uh, imperfectly right uh, from sound everything every sense has limitations and uh, you can compare yourself to other animals in the animal kingdom to see how limited we are in many aspects um, but you need to understand those let me give you an example of how perception could be very important and um, if you look at a uh, high definition tvs when they were coming online from an R&D perspective in the 80s and 90s and uh, when they were still you know not commonplace like they are today uh, one thing that studies found pretty quickly is that the size of the screen uh, was an important factor in whether humans could detect the difference between high definition and low definition if the screen is small enough and you're seeing the picture far enough uh, from where you are um, it doesn't matter how high definition the picture is you cannot tell the difference and there are plenty of studies that show this so because of this until tv manufacturers could make a large enough tv screen uh, consumers didn't see the value in high definition now you can see it because now you can have screens that are 70 inches and even larger than that uh, and because of that and at the viewing distances where we usually sit given that our homes are limited in space uh, you can see a big difference now uh, between high definition and standard definition uh, what else another thing that you need to understand is why customers make the choices that they make and this is actually difficult right and uh, notice one thing uh, a lot of aspects can actually be ascertained in the marketplace without asking customers like you can observe behavior for example i'll talk about that later but uh, motivation why people do things is tricky 
Okay, so if you want to learn about the motivations for people to do something, you're actually going to have to ask. Another aspect that is important in consumer behavior is this concept of learning, right? We are learning all the time. By the way, by learning, psychological learning, we really mean changes in behavior, right? Um, but learning is very important, right? As a consumer, you're learning about new product categories, not only because of technology, but also maybe because your life circumstances changes. So most of you right now probably don't have kids. Uh, maybe you have a younger brother that you change diapers to. Probably not. But if you do, you know all about diapers. And if you don't know about diapers right now, which you probably don't know much, uh, you will learn in a hurry the moment that you actually have a kid. Because obviously diapers... Not, they are not particularly exciting. They're going to be an important part of your life the moment you have a kid. And you are going to learn really quickly what works and what doesn't. Uh, so, because there are disastrous consequences when the diaper doesn't work properly, right? So, what I'm trying to say is that learning is happening all the time as a consumer. And it plays an important role in we learn about brands, we learn about products, and we behave accordingly. And this is another reason why we really need to understand that in the marketplace. There are many aspects, right? Attitude. Uh, attitude is a stable judgment that we make about things, whether they are products or brands. Those are the important uh, attitudes that you're going to try to learn about. So you're going to learn about things like brand attitudes, right? And those are important uh, aspects in marketing. What else? Another thing that we're going to use uh, in, in marketing also is this idea of personality, right? So these are stable traits uh, in people that make them behave in a consistent manner. And there are different personality tests. Uh, if you are interested in this space, I will encourage you to Google uh, the big five, uh, although there are other personality inventories. Uh, but these are essentially a large number of questions that try to characterize people into different personality archetypes or types, just to keep it simple. Uh, and personality, for example, is used a lot in segmentation, right? So when we're trying to understand what people really value in the marketplace, personality might actually be an important help. Then there are other things here, right? We also talk about social aspects, right? Uh, we are all social animals, like I've already discussed. Uh, so society plays an incredibly important role in what we do. Uh, we have different roles in society, so I am a professor, obviously, uh, but I'm also a dad at home, uh, and I also uh, take part in other groups within society, so I go to a gym, right, and at the gym, I'm just a nobody, right, I'm not like the, uh, I'm not teaching anybody anything at the gym, right, so my role within society changes, and I put on different hats, depending on what relationship I'm in, if I'm talking to my boss, the conversation, the way I'm dressed, is very different than if I'm talking to my kids, right? Because my position changes dramatically within society depending on what role I'm playing, right? So understanding these roles is important because a lot of the consumption patterns are going to be a function of this, right? What else are important things here? Reference groups. What is a reference group? It's somebody that we usually look up to uh, when making decisions. What kind of reference groups do you have? Your peers, right? Uh, as a college student, uh, you'll be surprised how many of the decisions that you make are actually driven by what others think about you, right? And maybe you do this subconsciously, but uh, like the music that you listen to when you are uh, around your peers, for example, uh, it's something that a lot of people will listen to different music, whether they are at home by themselves or with their peers. And the reason why is because there is a huge group influence uh, for all of us. So reference groups are very important. Social classes, right? Uh, this is determined by social economical status, right? So things like income, what kind of job do you have, right? Those are going to determine what is expected of you within the group. And because of that, you're going to behave differently. And then the last one, which I have, I have here is culture. And there are more, but these are the key aspects, right? Uh, culture is like a set of glasses that we look things through, right? We don't even realize that, you know, it's having an impact in, in what we are deciding, what we're doing as consumer, but it's, it's pervasive, it's everywhere, right? So for example, uh, as an American, which I'm not, but you are probably, um, I am a resident alien, right? 
Uh, but my kids are American, my wife's American, right? So I have an American side of the family. And I can see how things are dramatically different in general uh, in this country than they are in, for example, Spain, where I come from, right? So culture is going to dictate how you uh, make all sorts of decisions. Let me tell you a short, funny story. Uh, when I was uh, originally in Florida, where I studied, where I got my PhD. Uh, one thing that happened is I was trying to propose to my now wife. Uh, and to do that, I needed to get to the mall to buy a ring. Because, by the way, in Spain, you don't need to buy a ring uh, to propose. But you do in the U.S. and my wife's American. So I wanted to make sure that I was doing the right thing culturally, right? Even though I didn't understand why I was doing it. And anyway, long story short, right? I didn't have a car. And I was talking to uh, another lady who was basically in my class, in one of my classes at the University of Central Florida. And I was asking her, where could I buy, uh, where, where could I find a good jewelry store so that I could buy the ring? And she did a little map for me that looked really simple, right? It was basically making two right turns. And she told me in the mall is right there. You just need to drive a little bit. And she didn't say drive, right? You just need to go for a little bit and you'll get there, right? Yeah. And in Spain, uh, the way you measure any distance when you're asking anybody for directions, it's based on walking. The reason why is because you walk everywhere. Whereas here in the U.S., when anybody tells you that, you know, you need to go for 15 minutes, they mean driving and probably driving 40 45 miles per hour. So what happened is, uh, long story short, it took me three and a half hours to walk to the mall. Uh, because when she told me that, you know, all you need to do is go for a little bit, uh, she meant a little bit, uh, 45 miles per hour, but we walk about three miles per hour, right? So culture is going to basically permeate all decisions you make. And oftentimes you're not even going to notice that it's important because you just exposed to it all the time. It's like your glasses, right? You just see through it. Uh, what else about the consumers? How do they make decisions, right? And uh, understanding the decision making process is very important. And the way we make decisions, you know, you have different stages, right? We start with searching for information, right? If you're buying a uh, a new packet package of gum, right? You're probably not going to look for a lot of information. You're just going to go on a whim with whatever is close to you at the store. So this is why a lot of companies will place these convenience products by the checkout, by the checkout at the store because you just grab it without thinking much about it. But when you're buying a car or you're buying a house, you don't buy things like this, right? I mean, when you're buying a home, home uh, most uh, people only buy two or three homes in their lifetime. And it's usually the most expensive purchase you make. So what you're going to do is you're going to try to collect a lot of information to make sure, as much as you can, that you make the right purchase, right? So you're going to hire a real estate agent probably, and it's going to help you sort out through a lot of the information in the buying process, right? So this information search, this all this information that you're collecting by... Uh, Hiring maybe in this case even a, an expert that will help you uh, find the right home, right? And how you do it, it's going to vary depending on the decision that you're making and how much information search is going to depend a lot on how important the decision is for you. But it's essential that we understand how much of that information search is happening in the different categories we're selling and not only how much, but how is it done? Are they hiring an expert? Do they look at online reviews? Are they asking their friends for that information? Right? Then another thing that it's important is how do people evaluate the products, right? So what do I mean by this? Well, in the case of the home, what is the criteria that people are going to use for evaluation? Right? If you ask a real estate agent, they'll tell you it's there are three things that are important, right? It's location, location, location. But of course, the real estate agent is exaggerating uh, because for a buyer, there are going to be other aspects that are important when buying a home, like the budget, obviously, right? So how expensive the home is, but also things like square footage, right? How the, the home is laid out, right? How many uh, rooms are there? Where are there, right? If you have mobility issues, you know, you might need a bedroom in the first floor, 
right? So the criteria for evaluation is going to depend heavily on what's important for the customer. And this is going to vary from customer to customer. You need to understand what are the ingredients that go into that. And some of the ingredients that are going to go into that are going to be these attributes, right? And how important they are. And so what do I mean by attributes? These are features of the product or service that are important to the customer. So in the case of the home, what will be attributes? Well, like I was talking before, attributes will be things like location, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and what kind of uh, floors are in the home. Is it carpeted? Are they hardwood floors? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all attributes of the product. And some attributes are going to be very important to some buyers. Some attributes are going to be in import, unimportant to others. And you need to understand this uh, so that you can really pin down what, what should be offered in the marketplace. Okay. What else do you need to understand? Uh, where are people buying the products? Right? Are they buying them at physical stores? Are they buying them online? Uh, and if they are buying them in physical stores, which stores are they buying them at? Right? There might be you know, certain products that are purchased uh, in certain stores depending on the situation. Right? So you have uh, all products that are not buy at, bought at stores at all, right? like for example, uh, cans of soda. Right? So you have vending machines. So understanding really what's important for the customer. Is it about availability? Is it about price? Because if it's available, about availability, you're going to need smaller stores and that's, you know, and more frequent, more, more widespread, more widespreadly distributed, right? So if you're trying to get a quick can of soda, right? The important thing is not how expensive it is, but how quickly can I actually access it? Because it's maybe an inexpensive, relatively inexpensive purchase, right? So in that situation like that, convenience may actually trump uh, price. And because of that, you will just have a bunch of locations where these products offer, um, like vending machines, right? Uh, whereas if you're talking about buying the same soda cans in bulk, where maybe price matters more to you, Obviously, then you're going to be going to different outlets, right? Like Costco or wherever you shop, right? Uh, how is the product used, right? What is the value for the customer? Uh, products like baking soda, for example, are used for different purposes, right? And uh, so some people will use it for brushing their teeth. Other people will use it as an anti-acid. Other people will use it to deodorize the fridge. Right, so how is the product being used? Right, what is the benefit for the customer? And by the way, it doesn't have to be a functional benefit. It could also be an emotional benefit. Like there are certain products or brands that are associated with status or you know a description of who you are, and because of that, uh, it doesn't matter that functionally they are not very different. But if you're trying to portray a certain image into your reference groups, right, into the groups in society that you take part of, and um, you know, the benefits uh, and how the products use might actually be a function of, you know, other things like things like brands and perception, right? Uh, how frequently is the product used? Is it something that people buy a lot or little, right? In my case, I, I don't drink much, so I have uh, two or three beers a year, right? So I'm a very light uh, beer drinker, whereas maybe somebody else might actually have two or three beers a day. Right? So frequency of use is going to be very important because heavy users tend to behave differently. And I'm not talking about beer, I'm talking in general, than other people. Right? So there are some people that will have two or three smartphones and they use them, one for work, one for home, and I don't know, another one for whatever other purpose. Right? And, and people like this, the way they behave in the marketplace and their knowledge about the product category is going to be vastly different than when you have... People like me who are very really light users of certain products or don't use the products at all. And because of that, they don't know anything about the product category. Okay, good. So there are all these aspects and probably many more that you should be considering when you're thinking about your customers. What about the company? Well, there are many things that you can say about the company, but let me talk about the marketing aspects that I think are most important about the company. And, and this is going to be around this discussion that we already have about needs versus wants. You need to understand, and this is hard for companies to grasp sometimes, 
uh, that customers don't care about your products. What do I mean by this? Nobody buys a drill because they are excited about drills. Okay, fine. There could be some people that are, you know, uh, drill collectors, right? Like hand drills that you use for, you know, making holes in the wall or whatever you use your drill for. Um, but for the most part, nobody's excited about the product. They are excited about the benefit that they get from the product. So it's the fact that this is a tool that you can use to, you know, spin a drill bit and that drill bit can actually, you know, make a hole. That's the reason why people are excited about it. So it's not about the product, it's about the benefit. And if you understand this, you realize that maybe in the future, if you are a company like uh, Black & Decker, which makes a brand that may, you might have seen at Lowe's or Home Depot called The Walt, and if you're Black & Decker, uh, you might need to be worried about not only what Makita is up to or Bosch, any of the other companies that make drills, but also you might want to be looking at companies that are using other technologies for totally different purposes. How can those technologies be repurposed for uh, the same needs? So if the average person in a household buys a drill mostly to just hang pictures because they are not handy and the only reason why they buy it is because, you know, they are worried about you know, decorating their house, but that's about it. If they have any other problem, they're going to call a company to solve it. Uh, then in that situation, when a company like 3M introduces a product like Command, that are these little hooks that you can just put in the wall with a little, um, with a little um, rubber strip, uh, sorry, a sticky strip uh, behind it, like glue, right? Uh, that enables you to put the pictures up in the wall without having to drill a hole, that's going to have an impact into the demand for your product. Even though you don't see those two products as being similar because one is a drill and the other one is a little uh, hook that you can glue into the wall. If people are using the drill just to make holes in the wall to uh, hang pictures, they don't care that the drill can do other things because they are not going to use them. So for that consumer, uh, the need that is satisfied is the same by both products. If you are defining your product in terms of the physical attributes of the product, in the long term, you're going to get in trouble. So you need to define your products and your services in terms of the benefits that they provide. right? So we are not in the train business, we are in the transportation business. And this is a problem that you can see happening Today, companies like Amtrak have been losing money for 20 years now, right? Because planes happen and cars happen and they make their business model obsolete. Now, Amtrak still makes a decent amount of money in one aspect, which is basically delivering freight. So trains are still reasonably efficient at moving heavy, large objects, right? But in their passenger, uh, space in the US, it's a losing uh, money proposition because you have planes and cars that are a lot more efficient at doing either long distance flights, right, or shorter distance commutes because, you know, the car can give you a lot more flexibility, right? So don't forget that it's not about the product, it's about the need that you're satisfying. So if you think about companies like Google, what business are they in? Are they in the search engine business? No. What they do is they organize information for people in a way that is accessible and useful, right? Search engine is just one tool of many that they can create to actually do this. So it's about the need, right? It's about information access. It's not about the tool. It's not about the product. What else do you need to look at? You need to look at your competitors, right? Who are your competitors? Number one, you need to know who they are. Okay, especially your closest competitors. You might actually miss some competitors because they have products that are different, right? Substitutes, I've talked a little, bit, a little bit about that in the previous slides. But what do you need to know about your competitors as much as possible? You need to know, you know, what their cost structure is, right? Do they have some benefit that enables them to maybe uh, make things cheaper than you have, right? What kind of capabilities do they have, okay? Uh, do they have some brands that they can leverage that you don't have? Do they have 
uh, relationships with maybe retailers that enables them to get into market faster or cheaper, right? What kind of strategies do they use? Are they likely to retaliate if you drop price, right? Uh, are they not? Are they going to accommodate your price reduction, right? Uh, so what you need to do is you need to try to a make sure that you know who your competitors are both current and potential and that's hard to do especially the potential part the current ones you probably know who they are the potential ones hard to see sometimes technology can have big changes right you can see this companies like netflix right that you know reshaped the way we consume content right we went from renting dvds from blockbuster to actually getting movies online from netflix and there are a couple of steps in between, but you know your potential customers might actually not be obvious. In fact, uh, Blockbuster had the chance to buy Netflix twice, uh, and they passed on it. They thought that Netflix was for nerds that liked this online thing, and they were not going to be competing for the mainstream, which is where Blockbuster was at. And looks who's laughing now, right? So looking at who your potential competitors are. Might not be easy. Now, if you define your business in terms of benefits instead of in terms of products, then you will actually be more likely to identify these potential competitors. This is why it's important that you start by the definition of the business. Okay. And um, where are you going to get information about these competitors? Well, there are many ways you can visit the firms, right? Um, you can go to their websites, right? A lot of this information is public. Not all of it, but you know, uh, most companies not all but most companies are public companies and because of that they have to file annual reports right with the sec so they are going to have to tell their investors uh, what are they doing how things are going what kind of areas are they thinking about entering so you can get a lot of information from this okay so a lot of this information is public you can also go to their stores and check right you can buy their products and try to learn from their products this is called reverse engineering right and there are less legal means of doing this and i will never ever recommend you do anything like that but you know people have gone to jail for for example spying on the competition in illegal ways like using wiretaps obviously none of this is legal you shouldn't do any of it but it has happened in the past okay what else do you need to have into consideration uh, context what do i mean by context everything else that doesn't neatly fit into any of the uh, categories or buckets that i i have discussed or i'm going to discuss later we'll go into here so what are we talking about we're talking about political environment economic environment social environment and technology all these are very very important right because they can shape uh, the industry they can have dramatic changes and you need to keep uh, your ears up to make sure that you understand what's happening right so this is going to be very traditional stuff you're going to have to look at what politicians what kind of laws politicians are about to pass some companies will try to influence this through lobbying right to try to have laws that are more friendly to their industries and how is the economy doing is unemployment going up or down in this case right now we're in a difficult situation where for the last month suddenly now everything has dramatically changed we've gone from having the lowest unemployment in the history of the united states to probably in a couple of months uh, being in recession if not depression territory because the economy has come to a halt with all the coronavirus and uh, measures that we're taking right so what impact is this economic uh, slowdown or halt going to have in your industry right i mean if you are a company like boeing right now where you know nobody's going to be buying planes because uh, the whole travel industry and um, it's been heavily uh, stopped essentially and so what do you do if you're boring right how uh, they had plenty of trouble before the coronavirus but now uh, their situation is pretty dire the same thing for the airlines right what if you're delta and you need to cancel 80 percent of your flights Right? How are you going to make money? Right? How are you going to manage this situation? It's pretty complicated. Right? Social aspect, technology. Right? Technology changing. Right? Things dramatically over time. Right? Uh, you can see uh, who is doing well in these difficult economic times. 
companies like Netflix, why? Because everybody's staying at home. So what is really bad for the travel industry now suddenly becomes a boom for Netflix. So this economic impact, social impact, take impact can actually be very large, right? So, and then you have collaborators, right? This is the last bucket. Right? Who are your collaborators? Well, they could be upstream or downstream. What do I mean by this? Well, uh, if the company is right here, right? Let's say that you are Exxon, for example. This is an example about oil, right? Uh, if you are Exxon, what do you do as a business, right? So what do you do is, uh, they, they have different aspects. It's a large corporation, right? But uh, you're going to have some suppliers that are going to be upstream for you, right? Suppliers that are going to be upstream for you. And they are going to help you, for example, doing things like prospecting, right? Or maybe drilling and exploration, right? So these are going to be independent companies that are not necessarily associated with you as a company that are going to provide some services that are going to enable you to actually find the oil and maybe extract it. Okay. And after you extract that oil and you have it in your hands, maybe bought from the market, not necessarily uh, only the oil that you have extracted because Exxon has their own uh, capability for both prospecting and extracting, but they also use independent contractors that help them with this, right? And then what you're going to do is you're going to take that product and you're going to basically modify it uh, either yourself or have other companies that will do that for you. So some of the uh, large corporations like Exxon, they will have their own refining capabilities, but some of their product might actually be refined by other companies that will do this, right? And these companies will be your downstream, uh, downstream collaborators. So these are companies that help you, for example, uh, modify the oil and make the byproducts that you're going to be selling in the marketplace, like, for example, gasoline, right? And not only that, but maybe they'll help you sell it, right? So if you're an independent gas station, right, you will be a downstream collaborator from uh, Exxon, right? So if the company that we're talking about is Exxon, downstream collaborators is anybody that is between the company that makes the product, in this case, oil, and the final consumer. So the final consumer will be here to the right. The consumer will be here. Consumer, right? And upstream collaborators will be companies that are between the company that we're interested in and the raw materials that they are actually uh, needing for their operations, okay? So we're gonna have two different types of collaborators, upstream and downstream. And they are all important, right? In certain industries, the upstream uh, collaborators are gonna have, play a major role. In others, it's gonna be the downstream. It really depends on the industry. You need to be aware of both and you need to really understand who the key players are, okay? You're going to do this anyway, because they're going to be either your suppliers or your distribution chain, okay? The downstream is your distribution chain, your upstream is going to be your suppliers, okay? There is going to be uh, alliances that are going to happen, either because you need market access, right? So when you enter a new market, like if you go to China, for example, or you go to Japan and you want to sell your product or or your service, and you, you're gonna need market access. You're gonna need distributors that are going to be selling your product or service uh, in place, okay? And getting market access might actually require you to form an alliance with a company, right? The same thing with technology, right? If you decide now you need to do something that you weren't doing before, because maybe the market has changed. Now suddenly you're going to have to create some technology alliance. So let me give you an example of an alliance that was in the news in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there is an alliance between Honda and General Motors that is going to enable Honda to introduce electric vehicles in the United States in the, in the next three or four years, right? And the reason why this happened is because Honda has been taking a wait and see approach when it comes to the development of uh, electric vehicles. They do have small uh, presence in other markets like in Japan and in Europe, but they're just starting. They don't have all the capability when it comes down to this. And General Motors has invested really heavily, I think one or two billion dollars uh, in the last couple of years 
in developing a better uh, lithium cell technology that uses less cobalt. So what they have announced in the last couple of weeks is that Honda is going to use all this technology from General Motors to introduce their own Honda electric products in the US that are going to use essentially the platform that General Motors has developed, the cells that General Motors ha has developed, and also a lot of the technology around it. So for example, the cars that Honda are going to introduce are going to have some of the uh, smart uh, driving technology that is already developed by General Motors, like Super Cruise, that enables the car uh, in the highway to just essentially uh, autonomously uh, drive the car so you don't have to be providing input using cameras and other sensors okay so this will be an example of a technology alliance between honda and general motors which are collaborators it's interesting because they are also competitors in this space this is called competition by the way but you don't need to know that for the exam and what else uh, other than gathering all this information, what we're going to do is we're going to try to, like I said before, uh, segment the market. Where are we going to do this? We're going to divide the customers into homogeneous groups. Homogeneous means similar uh, groups in terms of their needs. And the reason why we do this is because we acknowledge that treating everybody differently or uniquely, better said, it's not economically feasible most of the time. So because of that, I mean, if you are making luxury jets, you can probably custom make all the jets because you're talking about a very expensive product. Uh, and in that situation, maybe it makes sense to uniquely treat all the customers. But if you're talking about other products, like even expensive products like a car, custom making cars is way expensive. And because of that, what you will observe in the marketplace is that companies try to identify these groups of homogeneous people in the sense that they have similar preferences and they call them segments and then they try to cater to each of those segments a unique set of either products or services that will enable them to satisfy better than if they would treat everybody the same so this idea of segmentation is kind of an in-between between selling to everybody the same and custom making things for each individual okay so we know what a segmentation is. We know what a segment is. Now, how are you going to identify these groups? Well, you're going to use different variables. Okay, they could be things like demographics. What is demographics? Things like gender or age, right? That are used to basically group people into homogeneous groups based on those. Assuming that people that have similar age and gender are going to have similar preferences. Now, notice, as you can you can probably realize this uh, people that have similar age and gender are going to have to some degree uh, similar preferences but not that similar so demographics is one of the most heavily used variables for segmentation because it's readily available and cheap to get if it's not readily available in your marketplace but the downside is that it's actually not one of the best because people that have similar demographics might actually have different preferences which is what we care about we care about what people want and need not you know whether they are a certain age or gender right that's not what we care about now we use those as tools to try to get there okay that doesn't mean they're not useful they're just better than nothing but not maybe the best you can do the same thing with geographic segmentation that's the idea of location being useful at determining also preferences and you can see this happens that certain neighborhoods uh, will have similar for example income and because of that people will have similar preferences and behaviors okay so there is a correlation between geography and uh, preferences but again like demographics is a little bit weaker right the good thing about geographic segmentation is that it's information that it's easily available this is one of the reasons why when you go to a store, people will ask you for your zip code. Why are they asking you for the zip code? Because they're trying to use geographic uh, demo, uh, geographic segmentation. They're trying to see where you come from and based on that, see if they can find a pattern that it's useful for them from a marketing perspective. Okay. Then you have psychographic segmentation. What is psychographic segmentation? That's when you look at things like lifestyle. You know, what kind of activities are you usually engaging in? 
right? Like some people love the outdoors and everything revolves around the outdoors. The kind of car they buy, the kind of uh, gear they buy, the kind of things they do on the weekends are going to be scheduled around this outdoors mentality. And because of that, they're going to buy products that are similar to other people that have this kind of lifestyle. Are you into health and fitness? Right. What is when I'm talking about psychographic segmentation, there are a whole host of uh, different lifestyles and values that people are going to have that are very close in many ways to preferences. So what is the upside of psychographic segmentation compared to the two we have discussed so far? Well, it's a lot closer to preferences. So because of that, it's more useful uh, segments that are defined from psychographic segmentation, the good thing that they have is that they are probably closer to preferences, which is a good thing. Okay, that's what we're trying to understand, consumer preferences. What is the downside of psychographic segmentation? Well, the downside is that uh, it takes a lot of questions to get there, right? So whereas getting demographic and geographic information, uh, three or four questions is sufficient, psychographic uh, questionnaires usually have 50 to 100 questions. Right, so gathering this information is very costly, time consuming, and it's not straightforward in any way. Right? And then the last one is behavioral segmentation. And I honestly like this one probably the best, although they all have their pluses and minuses. But what is the advantage of behavioral segmentation is that behavior is closely tied to preferences, right? People tend to do what you know they want to do. Yes, there are situations where you are forced to do things you don't want to do. But at the end of the day, in the long term, uh, people tend to gravitate towards the things that they like and they prefer. So if you observe behavior, uh, it's going to be very telling about preferences, at least in some ways, right? It's not a complete picture. You want to know more things, right? So psychographics could be useful anyway, because it will tell you more about why people do things instead of what they do, right? But behavior is very nice because it's closely tied to actual purchases, right? That's what you're observing. You're observing what people are doing. And the cool thing, or what I think is a revolution, honestly, in marketing, is the fact that we didn't used to have a lot of behavioral data. We had some, but now we have tons of behavioral data. And the reason why is smartphones. Everybody's carrying one with them. It has a bunch of sensors on it. And almost everything that you do during the day gets recorded somewhere, right? And what does Google know about you? Almost everything, right? They know who you are emailing, what you are emailing them about, okay? And they know where you're going with your phone. I'm assuming you have an Android phone, by the way, if you have an iPhone, which there's nothing wrong with an iPhone. Uh, then maybe Google doesn't have all that data, but it has some of the data, right? If you're using any of their services like Maps, for example. Anyway, so we have tons of behavioral data now because of technology, and we can leverage that uh, if we're smart uh, and at a pretty reasonable cost, whereas before getting behavioral data was costly and expensive, it requires surveys. Now you just have the data in your database. Use it. Now, once that we have the segments using whatever mix of variables, by the way, we don't need to use only one variable. You can use multiple variables. Use them all together. If you're interested in knowing how to do this, you should look into something called cluster analysis. But that's technical and it's beyond the scope of this class. Okay, so you can use multiple variables. You come up with your segments. Once that you have your segments, what kind of strategy are you going to follow? Well, it depends, right? Uh, if you don't use your segmentation, you're going to treat everybody the same, right? And so this is called, total, according to the book, total target market, right? So treating everybody in the marketplace the same, assuming everybody is the same, which we know is not true, but maybe because of economic reasons, maybe because we didn't do a segmentation study, so we don't know what the segments are, we're just going to assume everybody's treated the same by the company. And that's one option. The other option is to just identify a number of segments. Let's say in this diagram we have three different segments, but it could be seven. It doesn't really matter. Whatever comes out of the data, right? This should be data-driven, not just you know based on a guess. And then concentrate on our marketing efforts in one or a few of the segments. So not basically trying to capture every segment, not trying to establish relationship with every type of customer, but concentrating uh, what we think is going to be the most uh, profitable um, segment. Now notice um, 
the way we pick the segment is going to be a function of two things. It's going to be a function of how attractive the segment is. And this could be a function of things like size of the segment, growth of the segment, so how many customers are there, how, uh, how fast is that growing, right? Because it may be small today, but if it's growing really fast, it may become big uh, in a hurry, right? Uh, also, their purchasing uh, power, right? It may be a small segment, but because they they have quite a bit of purchasing power, then, you know, dollar-wise might actually be large, even though the number of people is small, right? So that's one of the aspects. And the other aspect that you should pick, uh, sorry, used to pick the segment instead of uh, being attractiveness is also fit, fit to the company. What kind of capabilities do we have that are going to basically enable us to uh, provide superior value to that segment, right? So if we are very good at something that they care about, then probably choosing that segment will be smart, right? So it's fit and attractiveness. And then the other approach is you can have multi-segment approach, right? Instead of concentrating one segment, you could do more than one, okay? The important thing to notice is, notice here, that there are two different strategies for two different segments. Okay, if you're treating everybody the same, you only have one strategy, you are here, right? You are in this approach, but if you, take multiple segments and each segment has a different strategy and different strategy could be different products it could be any any of the uh, marketing mix aspects we're going to talk about later right which is either product price promotion or place any of those piece being different will mean a different strategy for each of these segments so maybe they want to shop online the products the same another set of people want to shop at brick, uh, brick and more, more traditional stores. The product may be exactly the same, but you know they use a different channel of distribution. That will be two different strategies for two different segments. And how are we gonna make all this strategy actually real? What we're gonna do is we're gonna trans translate that segmentation, targeting and positioning into our marketing tools, which are gonna be our four Ps, right? So we're gonna have a product, we're going to have price, we're going to have distribution, which is the, uh, if you want to use the four piece uh, acronym, it will be place, and we're going to use promotion. And essentially what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to use these four tools in a way that enables us to achieve our positioning uh, interest, right? So how we want to be perceived by the customer. So there you go. And we'll talk about this in quite a bit of detail on the next lecture.